From a closet, also known as the Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers World Headquarters Studio, this is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com forward slash podcast. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer. This is a podcast about making your life better through marinating your mind in good stuff. My name is Jim McCarthy, owner, operator, and chief bottle watcher at Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers, and I believe that as business owners and entrepreneurs and just people in general, we are bombarded by negativity every day. It's a, kind of the last thing we need. If you want to see your life and business change for the better, I recommend consuming, nurturing, good stuff. As usual, the primer is brought to you by Big Dot Lighting and Electrical. We are a Middle Tennessee commercial and residential services company. Our specialty is in converting your business to energy efficient LED lighting. And of course, we do a lot of things uh, in terms of electrical services, ground up build outs, uh, pretty much anything electrical as well. Uh, but leading with that whole LED thing, that seems to be all the rage. Um, a lot of things going on as of late. If you uh, haven't noticed, we've got a a little bit of a, a virus going around the country that uh, people may or may not have been talking about. Um, some people call it the big flu, or the bad flu, actually. Um, there are a lot of things that, in the recent episodes I've been talking about, trying to keep it light, trying to keep it positive, hopefully enabling you to marinate your mind in good stuff that we talk about here. But in, in, in light of recent events... Things get heavy, okay? There's a lot of interesting, uncertain types of events that are happening. Things that we never probably thought we'd ever see in our lifetime. Um, and if you look at some of the things that are going on today, you see um, on other podcasts that I help produce, in Pennsylvania, sir, uh, for example, there is an edict and a lockdown in the state that's uh, a little bit more egregious than a lot of the other states where uh, a lot of the essential businesses that are deemed essential um, in other states are not essential in Pennsylvania, such as car dealerships. They can service cars. Well, I think they could service cars. They can't sell them. So there's a lot of varying differences from state to state, such as Kentucky. The governor of Kentucky is now saying that uh, if we gather this Easter weekend, in, in groups that he's going to report us via our license plates, things of that nature. Now, my guest today is uh, someone I've known all my life, quite literally. Uh, I've grown up with him, and uh, it's the first time he's been on my show. We've been trying to get this done for quite a while. Uh, he is my, my longtime brother. We've been brothers for about 44 years, uh, going on 45 in August. He uh, left... Our hometown of Danbury, Connecticut, I want to say in 1994-95, to pursue uh, his career or start his career as a law student and then subsequent attorney, and he's done amazing things since then. Please welcome on my brother, Daniel McCarthy Esquire. How you doing? Thanks for having me, Brother Jim. Is that a good, is that a good uh, intro? I couldn't, couldn't think of a better intro. <laughs> I'm sure you probably could have. Um, <clears throat> catch us up on, you know, uh, I've heard a great quote as of late on one of my other podcasts that I produce. One of the hosts always says, well, before we believe the message, we have to believe the messenger. So give me in a nutshell your qualifications. I'm, I'm very well aware of them. Um, but, you know, for people who are getting introduced to you, just kind of give it to us in a nutshell if you could. Well, uh, I've been a lawyer, practicing lawyer for over 20 years. I specialize in appellate litigation. Um, for those of you that don't know what that entails, uh, it's really legal work at the next level up beyond the trial court. So for example, when you hear people, I'm going to see you on appeal, they would hire a lawyer like me to take on the appeal or to defend the appeal. Um, so uh, the appellate courts are concerned primarily with legal arguments, whereas when you go to trial, trial courts are predominantly uh, focused on deciding what the facts of the case are. So that, in a nutshell, is what I have been doing. I've been um, 
I was with one firm for approximately 20 years. And most recently, about six months ago, I just joined the Butzel Long firm in Michigan, one of Michigan's largest law firms. Now, tell me why you got into law. How did that story uh, come down? I think it was a lot of different reasons. Um, I think I always had a natural interest in, in becoming an attorney. Um, it started off, as I recall, um, I had a landlord-tenant dispute that I handled on my own, and that sparked a, an interest to dig deeper. Um, our family business was in telephone installation and design and computers, and um, I just did not see myself uh, doing that type of work for the rest of my life. Um, contrary to the wishes of our father, I just didn't share the same Passion. desire and enthusiasm for <laughs> Phone. pursuing that that um that line of work um and um you know i i don't i didn't go to law school with uh, a clear idea as to what type of lawyer i wanted to be i primarily went to law school just to see if i can get through the program huh. um and as i got into the program i fell in love with it and uh i don't think i was smarter than anybody else i just think i liked what i was doing and I succeeded at what I was doing. Plus, you didn't really like taking shit from people. <laughs> Light way of saying it. <laughs> and you wanted to go through the legal rem. I, I remember those days early on, and I remember that instance about the uh, the landlord dispute. Uh, it was it was a very interesting time, and um, I do remember being on jobs with you in certain law firms and pulling wire and going, "The hell are we doing here, man?" <laughs> But hey, you know, it, it afforded us a nice childhood growing up and uh, dad did a great job, you know? No, there was nothing, you know, we love our dad and he did the best, uh, what he, we, he did the best with us, uh, with what he, with, with what he had, Yeah, you know, for a guy that never went past the eighth grade, he, um, did he not know, graduate high school? How did I not know that? Dad never went past the eighth grade. Really? Yeah. He dropped out. Um, he had to have been around 14 years old. Um, I don't know if he went to, he had to have went to work right away doing something, but then he went to the service. I think, honestly, I think when he was 17, Yeah. spent two or three years in the service. Dad break the r rules, really? Dad broke, uh, when did he not break the rules? <laughs> he, he was quite the hustler. He would do what he had to do. I always tell this, the pizza story. Did I ever tell you the pizza story? No. I've been telling it a lot lately on the show where basically when, when we pulled the business into the house in the 90s, I think it was 1990 or so, <clears throat> it might have been even 91, but um, we were building out the basement office, as you remember, Yeah. and uh, dad had cut all his overhead, pulled the, closed his office in Elmsford, New York. We were moving everything into the house, and we were building out the office. I was up on top of a ladder, Yep. and I was, oddly enough, installing a light fixture. And he was down below holding the ladder, giving me stuff. And I was just wiring it up and whatever. And I said, Hey, why don't we get a pizza for lunch? And he, uh, he kind of looked, you know, gave me one of these very matter of fact looks and said, well, we can't. Oh, okay. Well, why is that? So we don't have the money. I'm like for a $20 pizza. Really? We don't have the money. Hmm? We don't. So it was, it was quite sobering at that time. And uh, yeah. I always tell people it's my first memory of tough economic times. I think I was a freshman in college. Yes, that would be true. So getting into this, uh, a lot of people are, I'm, I'm seeing social media blowing up with, you know, if you got, you know, nobody knows what the truth is. You got, you know, well, we got to go by the science of what's happening with the coronavirus and COVID-19. The science, the science, well, the science says a whole bunch of different things. We've got studies from over here. We've got studies from over there. One scientist is saying, well, this is going to peak here and it's not as bad as we all think. And you got other scientists that are saying, oh my gosh, we're going to be go doing this throughout the rest of the year. Probably we don't know what to believe. So the, the reality is, is that the, the, uh, the constitutionality of all the different lockdowns that are going on in combination with the social shaming, the self-righteousness, and the people that feel good about themselves because they're listening to the government and all this other stuff is akin to, I hate to say it, what led up to 
as we now know, Nazi Germany. Okay, these types of things kind of propelled their way into society. And over the course of three to four years, that's what the model of Europe started to become. I, I hate to say it, but, you know, the quickening of some of the things that I'm seeing in headlines, and I'm, I ha- I don't, I'm not trying to get into stories and stuff like that. I read headlines. I probably should delve a little bit deeper on some of the stuff that I see. But I really don't because I don't want to marinate my mind in bad stuff and get mired in this. But you read the headlines. They start you know, planting seeds, whether they're truth or not is a whole different story. Some of the headlines are talking about how the WHO, well, they want to come into your house and take your kid if the kid is sick or somebody in the house, if they're sick, if they got this thing and they're going to, we want the right to be able to do that. Well, go screw yourself. No, hell no. You want to start a civil war? Start doing that. So the constitutionality of it, we'll cover that. And we'll also cover an initiative that you're working on or have, excuse me, have been working on with businesses in your community. My brother is up and has been a resident of Michigan for several years, the, the entire time that you've been an attorney. And that state is akin to what I was talking to, talking about in the beginning of the show, similar to Pennsylvania, very stringent on the lockdowns from what it sounds like. Is that true? Yeah. Um, on April 9th, dad's birthday, mm-hmm. uh, the governor issued a revised executive uh, order. Um, extending the uh, stay-at-home mandate uh, to April 30th, well, technically May 1st. Um, and um, what, were, what were your first initial, your initial thoughts when you saw that? What was your reaction? Well, I think a lot of people here are kind of shell-shocked by how sudden things progressed. You know, March started off, as I recall, People aware of the virus, um, it was it was spreading, um, and the whole social distancing um, moniker really hadn't hadn't been disseminated yet. It, was, it wasn't until like the second week of March when things seemed to speed up, speed up quickly in terms of um, my children's school suddenly said we're not going back to school. Um, I think they made that decision on the, like the second Friday of March. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just before their, they had a scheduled spring break week off anyway. And so the school started closing down. Um, the thought was, well, okay, this would just be a two week, just kind of take it easy. Um, message that would resolve like by april 1st april 2nd that we would everything would be back by april 1st april 2nd on march 23rd the governor issued her first uh, um big time emergency order that extended um she asked for emergency powers the legislature gave her emergency uh relief and she extended her stay-at-home mandate to uh, april 13th Mm -hmm. uh, which would have been monday um and generally speaking you know um you were divided into either an essential worker or a non-essential worker and there haven't been good definitions provided as to what distinguishes between what's essential and what's non-essential which led to a lot of confusion um if you were caught outside by uh doing something prohibited, you were potentially subject to criminal penalties and a thousand dollar fine. Um, I think for that period between March 23rd and April 9th, um, (coughs) a lot of, um, there was a lot of confusion. Um, Most of the people in Michigan did mandate the, uh, did, did adhere to the stay at home mandate. A lot of businesses, uh, professional office buildings. My firm, for example, said, okay, um, all, all employees are going to work from home now, mm-hmm. um, you know, except for healthcare providers, hospitals, uh, certain critical functions of the courts. Um, the court system sent, issued an order that um, in my business, appellate filings are suspended during the time period. So if you had to file something between March 23rd and April 9th, 
um, I mean, or, in, or between March 23rd and April 13th, that everything was uh, suspended uh, until the uh, emergency stay-at-home mandate was lifted. Um, on April 9th, the governor announced that she was extending the stay-at-home mandate to the end of the month now. And she was citing um, concerns or reports coming out of the University of Michigan on certain modeling that demonstrated that the number of cases in Michigan uh, has not yet reached its peak, mm -hmm. um, that the number of cases increased exponentially. Um, we were approaching almost, um, um, it was well over 20,000 documented cases of the COVID virus hundreds of deaths. Um, and so uh, more and more people stayed home. You had to go to the grocery store. Um, the few times that I've went, you see people wearing gloves, you see them wearing surgical masks. I see people wearing uh, sawdust masks that they buy at Home Depot. <laughs> um, rubber gloves. Um, staying away. I mean, it's, it's, it was really psychological where you go out to the public and you see another human being and you want to avoid them because they're perceived to be dangerous. Yeah. Uh, everyone's a threat. Um, so uh, she extended it again and um, I forgot where we were going. Well, basically talking about the uh, constitutionality, what is your opinion on, on all these stories that are, I mean, true or false? You know, you and I, on a recent phone call, we talked about dad and uh, dad was a little bit um, conspiratorial back in the day. Um, yeah. I can understand where he came from. Uh, I believe that a lot of these types of theories that uh, came up in the past uh, just needed a little bit of time for them to uh, be realized somewhat in the future. Um, and I, I got, I kind of got into it myself in the 08, 09 and 10 and 11. And, uh, you know, I kind of got out of it since then, but there are a lot of things I remember them talking about back then when I was into it, that I'm, we're, we're starting to come to see, come to fruition. So talk about the con, you know, what in your world is being spoken about regarding the legality of these lockdowns and the civil liberty suspensions and all that stuff. Well, right now, um, there's, a, there's, in the legal circles, there's definite discussion. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the governor is acting on statutory authority. All right? Our Michigan Constitution gives the governor certain emergency authority to act in times of, of, of emergency. Um, and the real, the most, the, 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 at a 30,000 square foot level, the question is, are these emergency orders and shutting down and preventing people from basically going outside except for extremely narrow purposes, um, is that constitutional under the, uh, is that a, number one, a proper interpretation of her statutory emergency power under the state constitution? And even if it is, does it nevertheless violate our United States constitution? Um, right now, the governor's emergency order is based upon cooperation with the legislature of the state. Mm -hmm. Before the governor extended her stay-at-home mandate to the end of the month, the legislature voted to extend um, her power to the end of the month. The governor made uh, statements that she wanted to extend the stay-at-home mandate for another 70 days. Mm -hmm. And in making that statement, that created confusion because people didn't know when that 70-day period was going to begin. Did it begin on March 23rd? Or did she intend for this 70-day uh, period to start upon the expiration of the first <laughs> emergency order on April 13th? So there was confusion over that. Um, the governor also said that if the legislature did not extend her emergency authority to the end of the month of April, that she was going to rely on another statutory provision that her office says gives her unilateral authority to extend the stay-at-home mandate without going through the legislature. 
So your stay-at-home mandate is strictly, you cannot even go out. Can you go outside for a walk if you wanted to? He said you can go outside for a walk. Mm -hmm. You can go jogging. You can go kayaking. Mm -hmm. Um, You can go to the grocery store. You can go fill a prescription. You can go um, uh, certain items from like Home Depot and hardware stores and auto supply stores. You can can still uh, go. Um, when you go to the grocery store, um, certain like Meyer and Kroger in our state have put in, um, these plexiglass shields in front of the cashiers yeah, to dust, protect dust them. Yeah. Okay. Um, but other than that, it's, it's a real shutdown. Yeah. Um, and there's some report, I haven't heard, I haven't seen them, but there's some reports that people have been <laughs> ticketed. Uh, already um and there have been at least two lawsuits filed in federal court in michigan challenging some aspects of the governor's orders um one lawsuit was filed last week comprising three individuals who claimed that the emergency orders violated their first amendment rights to peacefully assemble uh to protest uh, abortion clinics Mm -hmm. And I read just a few days ago that the governor um, relaxed an aspect of her order to allow peaceful protest under the First Amendment. Another lawsuit was filed against uh, her order with respect to Freedom of Information Act requests. So, for example, if you want to get information from a city or a governmental entity, you would file a Freedom of Information Act request, or FOIA for short. Mm -hmm. She entered an order that extended or adjourned the time period for clerks to comply with FOIA requests, uh, I believe until June, Mm. Um, which makes things kind of interesting because the governor's stay-at-home mandate, she says she's relying on modeling coming from the University of Michigan. Unfortunately, the data and methodologies that the University of Michigan is providing in its modeling is not publicly available. So even if you wanted to FOIA that information, the University of Michigan now can say, well, we don't have to respond to you right away because the governor adjourned the time period for responding until June. And so, in my, which led to why we're talking, I had a group of clients that um, are uh, very, very apprehensive about their businesses, their livelihoods, their livelihoods of their families. Um, everything they've built. Everything. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's, these are tough decisions because uh, no one wants to come across as callous or insensitive um, or unsympathetic to the to the position that the governor's in on what do I do in a state that's getting hit with multitudes of you know tens of thousands of these COVID-19 cases deaths that are um, reportedly due to the COVID-19 increasing daily do you know what those numbers are off the top of your head like, Off the top of my head, it's over 22,000 cases, and uh, the deaths are in the hundreds. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds the same. It's hard, it's hard to get accurate information. Well, you know, cause of death is, is, is done by a medical examiner, right. and we believe that the hospitals are required to report to the governor the cause of death. So, um, but I have a group of physicians that I've been speaking to that, say, you know, while the cause of death may be COVID-19, the person could have also been suffering from a number of other ailments that COVID-19 only, you know, was a straw on the camel's back, so to speak, that have caused it. Um, It didn't help the the situation. It was a comorbidity phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the general consensus is that the virus is easily spreadable. Um, you know, they, they, they ask, they, they say that a six foot distance is, should be implemented. I've heard reports from, I think an expert from MIT said, well, six feet isn't, 
enough. You really need 27 feet because if a person sneezes or coughs, that the droplets can travel beyond six feet. Um, I've heard reports saying that the COVID-19 virus could be spread through the air. Some people said it can't. Um, it lives on surfaces for 13 hours and all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, as you started off, it's but hard it's, to get a real answer on what this COVID-19 actually is and how it's transmitted and how long it lasts. Um, because admittedly, all the scientists, what they do agree on is they don't know enough about it yet. Yeah. Um, so politically, the, government, the governor is in a tough position yeah. because on the one hand, you know, she's obligated to preserve the health, welfare, and safety of the citizens. At the same time, there's a growing concern <laughs> that by doing so, the economy is getting destroyed. And so many people, while they can get healthy and stay healthy and stay protected, uh, they have another problem facing their way when, it's t- when she says, okay, it's time to go back to work. And when that directive comes, there's no work to go back to. Yeah. And so my clients have asked to um, have come together and they represent a cross section of different industries. Um, and it's not a political endeavor. What they want to do is they've pulled their money. We've hired a, an expert modeler to evaluate the data that's known and at least offer the governor a chance to look at and consider this other model. And hopefully that by the time uh, the current stay-at-home mandate expires at the end of the month, that she has in place an orderly and safe return to work for Michigan's uh, citizens. Right. And so they're coming together with some helpful suggestions on how to make that orderly process go forward. And so all we're trying to do is communicate that message to the governor. Um, we know that she's listening to uh, a group of um, CEOs from the state's largest corporations, including General Motors, CEOs from the largest hospital systems. Um, We know that uh, some chambers of commerce are also on that task force as well. Mm -hmm. But my particular clients, you know, want to have their voices heard as well. And so they've taken the time and the money and the energy to invest in this report uh, from an expert, uh, an economic expert, that they've paid for right and they're offering it to the state for consideration and um to say look at our data it's it's available you can test it you can challenge it we just we just want to show you that uh we believe that the peak has already passed and that um by the time may rolls around we should have in place a plan to at least allow a number of sectors of business to reopen and not to avoid a total economic collapse and perhaps get away from differentiating differentiating between essential and non-essential businesses but consider what is safe and maybe not safe you know depending on the vulnerabilities of the citizens at large i mean the virus affects everyone differently apparently you know um it's possible that we have had it and yeah. not have known it. That's it's possible true. we could have been a carrier of it and <clears throat> transmitted it without knowing about it. Um, those that have had it have, re- you know, there's many people that have recovered from it. Those that have had it have had different experiences with, with the virus. Um, but again, you know, we have to have some sort of plan in place to. What's the end game? Assure people that. There's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we're going to get out of this. Because I think right now, by communicating that the virus is dangerous, that we haven't hit our peak, and, we, and we're just going to re-examine where we are at the end of the month and not have, not communicate, at least acknowledging a certain plan in place to uh, back off some of these restrictions. I think is important. What are some of the sentiments that your clients have as business owners and people running businesses? What, what is, do they have any sort of plans that they've talked to you in terms of, okay, when the thing lifts, 
Here's how we're going to get back on our feet. Here's how we're going to start hiring again. Sure. You know, um, for example, there's a number of, of, um, um, techniques that they can employ. Uh, and it's different for each business. You know, I have one client that's a major car dealer in, in the state in, in Michigan, uh, employs over uh, 3,000 employees and had to furlough 2,000 of them in a period of less than two weeks. Yeah. Uh, that's huge. How many uh, dealerships does he own? <clears throat> I, I, I don't know offhand. Right. Um, 3,000 uh, is, is quite a I'm, large I've been, number. I've been speaking to clients over the phone um, that have become clients that I've never met before. Right. Um, they've just heard through the grapevine about this proposal and initiative. And, um, you know, they, they, they have plans in place to keep their employees safe. They can keep desks spread apart. They can. Common sense initiative. Of, Just a common it's, sense it's initiative. Pre- pretty much. Um, <clears throat> you know, the problem is, is that. I don't think there's ever a guarantee that you're going to completely eliminate the virus. Of course not. You know, as long as you have people going out of their homes and interacting the public in any way, shape, or form, even going to the grocery store, the doctor's office, or pharmacy, you're having contact with other people. So social distancing has its flaws. Um, it's not. It's not 100%. Um, logically, it's just not going to work 100% if you're going to have. Uh, some form of contact. Yeah. Um, but I do believe that, you know, the government, while it has a responsibility to protect the health, safety, and welfare of people, it does have an equal responsibility to say, well, um, the economy is, is, is important too. Um, and um, it's a delicate balance. It's a hard, it's a hard, hard, hard um, balance to um, navigate through during these times. And what we're just trying to do is help the governor uh, with a suggested workable path. Right. An alternative that's best, that's best, viewpoint. Best for all. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, because a lot of the knee-jerk reactions have been based off of one, one solution that seemingly everybody agreed upon. I don't know when that happened or who agreed with it, but there seems to be just, like we were talking about, a lot of different angles coming out of different areas saying, well, look, you know, the, the herd immunization aspect of it, meaning if we, if some of us do get it and we have a little bit of a spike, the herd um, infection has to happen in order to immunize, immu- immunize heard, ourselves. I've, I've read, I've read articles about that. <clears throat> yeah. That's known as herd immunity. Right. That we need to develop that in order to uh, get past it. To, um, Destroy the virus, basically, or or just acclimate to it. Just you I've know. also read that that won't work with you know elderly people, people that have um, compromised immune systems. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, look, I'm not a scientist, right? You know, we we don't know. Um, I just I I've, I've been hearing from people on you know phone calls and stuff that you know, everybody's talking about this. Um, I honestly believe the beginning of this thing whole happened because, you know, the media just whipped it up into a frenzy and it just, it became its a life of its own. A lot of people that I talked to, some of whom, you know, very well, uh, well, the you know, well, don't, don't, you know, they, they talk about Trump and, you know, he's not listening to the scientists. Why would you believe science? I'm like, well, because there are different elements of science. you still don't know what to believe. Science changes. Okay. If you look at the, um, the orthodox ways that these the typical diseases and infections spread themselves, it just happens, okay? Doing this kind of thing is just not natural. It's, you know, it, once we come out of these things, it gives the disease a, t- a chance to once again run rampant. Then what, okay? What happens when flu season comes around again next year? Are we going to do this again for six months? We can't. We got to, at some point, face the facts and, well, we're going to have a, a, you know, a immunization or... Uh, antibiotic or something that we can all get immunized or um, uh, what do they call that? The, um, the vaccination, which is another story to be told. It's like, I don't want to get another vaccination out there for crying out loud. What you know, I don't know. Here we are just living it's through. Not, it. There's not a clear answer to this. Problem. There isn't. That's uh, and, and that's that in and of itself is a problem. It's frustrating. It is. Yeah. But 
you know, people need hope. People need plan. I need a plan. People need to um, feel hopeful that they can get back to work. Um, and I, I, I do believe that you, there's going to be a, a um, I think the cases are going to reduce. Um, the, 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 um, I've spent a lot of time in this past week and a half talking with clients, um, talking with my colleagues, uh, researching uh, these issues, putting together a, a, um, a helpful communication to the, to the governor. Um, it's not intended to be a political attack. It's not intended to take, you know, to uh, criticize right. uh, her decisions in any way, shape, or form. You're trying to be helpful. We are just trying to offer a unified suggestion um, from some wise and experienced professionals and, uh, and say, look, you know, we, we, here's, here's a, a workable path for you to consider. Uh, we're not demanding that you consider it. We're, we're asking you to. And I think there's a substantive difference in, in doing that. Um, and I think the governor, like any other person of great responsibility, um, would welcome it. Yeah. Uh, to, hear, to hear, you know, uh, the resolve of some of these um, patriotic Michigan citizens that really care um, about not allowing or, you know, it's, it's even, it's so hard to message appropriately too. Um, I get it. You're trying not to be not, political. Not destroying it. the economy at yeah. the same time, understanding and being sympathetic to uh, how severe the virus is. Right. You know, to those families who've had a family member die of COVID-19, that's a real slap that's a that's a real wake-up call and to those people to suggest hey let's just go back to work who cares mm -hmm. that nothing can be more insulting but my clients are not just business owners and leaders they're fathers their husbands their mothers daughters sisters brothers i mean they're people too um <coughs> with families mm -hmm. um it's a, it's a, it's a catch-22 situation for anybody in leadership but are, are there any initiatives like this being uh, put together in other states that you're aware of? None. I don't know. I mean, I'm not suggesting that there aren't. I right. just haven't heard of them. Okay. Been, but also, so you're kind of trailblazing. focused on doing my own right. initiative. So for the people listening or watching this, um, take a look at, is there anywhere online that, or is it just kind of like loosely put together any sort of a link that they can go to to look more into it or... Uh, not yet. Um, is there a collection, not a collection, but a cabal of uh, uh, investigators or analysts that can put together a study of their own in their own states, or would they use your person that you used, um, or is kind of more of an objective viewpoint as to what's going on with the, each individual state's numbers? Well, our expert is primarily focused on Michigan data. Okay. Okay. But um, there are experts at hand readily available to do the same thing in other states. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, um, and the question is, it's like, it's like any court case. It's a lot of court cases come down to a battle of the experts. Even the experts can disagree with each other on which methodology is best. Yep. Um, you know, we'd like to think that the expert that, you know, our clients have agreed upon um, is pretty solid. Right. Uh, and using data that's um, not controversial. And really not subject to uh, huge interpretation. Um, but um, your desire is to get the governor to say, hey, there are a lot more things to consider, as you well know, from the small to mid sized businesses that are in the state that also have concerns, not just from the biggies that you're, that you're getting you know, counsel from. Uh, we want to. Um, objectively bring this information to you and try and help out the situation because we understand you're getting it from a single source you know 
the, of which we cannot get data from and analyze it ourselves as citizens, which, you know, so we went ahead and did it our, on our own is what you're saying. Correct. Right. Okay. So what do you want people to know from this in terms of what is, what is your, you, you just want them to analyze it, but you want, is your objective to end it at the end of April? Okay. If we're going to be at the end of April, are we saying we're done? Can we have clarity on that? Yeah, naturally speaking, um, you know, my clients absolutely want to get want to get moving uh, in the beginning of May. Yeah. Um, you know, they've all agreed and accepted that. Okay, it may be. Let's be safe. Let's ex- let's wait wait it out through the month of April. Ramp back up. Okay, but yeah. now that we're going to be approaching this, the last two weeks of April, you know, we believe that you know. We need to also talk about let's start planning um, for reopening lines of work if the data shows that this virus is starting to subside. Mm-hmm. Um, because the report's also going to show that if the stay at home mandate is prolonged for- further, uh, there may be industries that'll never come back. Yeah. Um, it'll be forever destroyed. And, you know, um, you know, Michigan basically traded one problem for yet another. You mm-hmm. know, um, many deaths were caused during the Great Depression as well. And we don't need to go into the reasons why. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Oh, and that's been made apparent with several stories that you see as well. You know, so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's hard, but... Um, my people are care very much about what um, about their families, about their employees, of about course. their citizens. They wouldn't have been successful in their respective fields if they didn't if they didn't care about what they were doing and and how they how their actions impacted other people. Yeah. So you know, uh, I'll you know, this is a hard initiative to put together because again, you know, there's there's justifiable concerns amongst many Michigan people that are afraid of the virus and and naturally so. But we can't, I think everyone would agree at the end of the day, you can't allow fear to dictate your future. No. You gotta gotta resolve through this fear and find a way out of it. Well, how can people get a, do you want people to reach out to you if they're interested in doing something like this in your, in their state? Or if you want to contact me, I'm, you know, I'll be happy to do it. I don't know how much time I'll have to talk to them until I get this project finished. Of course. Um, but we're you know, hoping to get, we're hoping to, um, we're hoping to get our message out by, uh, Monday. Okay. Well, this will uh, come out then as well. And you can put it out on the socials as they say. Um, we'll put the contact information down below in the description. Dan, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been a uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, For those of you listening, if you have any questions about any of this, you can always reach out to me. Uh, You can reach out to my brother. Um, uh, If you're a business in Michigan that uh, that wants to, uh, I guess, get on board and be another voice in this initiative, please reach out to Dan as well. Um, If you want to subscribe to this podcast, if you have guest ideas, any other ideas that we should be talking about, reach out to me, jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com forward slash podcast. Uh, You can always reach out there. You can subscribe there. All the different uh, uh, areas and and platforms are all right there. So please do uh, and uh, check us out all over the web and share with your friends if you found any value in this podcast. Once again, Dan, I thank you for being on. Thank you. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com forward slash podcast.